This Rubik's Cube is my password. Or more specifically, my password is encoded on this Rubik's Cube. And by the end of this video, you too will be able to take any Rubik's Cube lying around and store your own secret message onto it. But not only that, you will also be able to figure out the secret message on this Rubik's Cube right here with absolutely no cubing experience required. But first, we have to understand how all this works. Let's start with an example of encoding a simple message like hello onto the Rubik's Cube. The first step is to simplify this task. Let's transform our message into ASCII, turning it into a series of ones and zeros and then take this binary number and turn it into a normal base 10 number. Now our task just went from storing arbitrary data on a cube to storing a number onto a cube, a bit more manageable. The easiest way to do this is to not think of it as storing the number on the cube, but rather as having a one-to-one -one mapping between a number and a state on the cube or a cube state and vice versa. That way we can have an encoding function that turns a number into a cube state and another decoding function that turns a cube state back into a number. That way a single cube state can effectively store one number. However, there there's a limit we have to keep in mind. There are only 43 quintillion or so unique Rubik's Cube states, and since we want exactly one number per state and vice versa to maintain the one-to-one -one relationship, we can only encode numbers from zero up to that limit minus one. Establishing a one-to-one -one relationship is a bit tricky, but let's go over how it's possible, starting with how we can transform a cube state into a number. Instead of looking at a Rubik's Cube based off the colors on each side, it's much easier to look at the individual pieces. After all, that's what the cube is made of and what you're turning. We have two types of pieces. There are 8 corners with 3 colors each, and 12 edges with 2 colors each. And for each piece, we care about two things, its permutation, or where the piece is on the cube, and its orientation, or how the individual piece is twisted or flipped. Since the 6 centers on a cube always stay where they are regardless of how you turn it, we can ignore them for now. Thankfully, we can consider each of these 4 categories of piece and piece attribute separately, edge permutation, corner permutation, edge orientation, and corner orientation, which lets us break things down into sub-problems. With a little bit of math, we can turn a unique case in each one of those four categories into a single unique number, carefully observing where the pieces are and how they're rotated. We have to be careful with a few things. For example, when it comes to orienting the corners, some states are impossible. The infamous corner twist is an example of that. As it turns out, only the orientations of seven corners can be arbitrarily modified out of the eight. We have to set the last one based off the other seven to ensure it's a possible state, and thus we only need to encode seven corners. Edge orientation is similar. Only the orientation of 11 edges can be arbitrarily modified out of the 12. The last one is set by the other 11. The more tricky and less obvious issue is that of permutation parity. In order to understand permutation parity, let's first do an example of calculating it for the corners. To start, we count up the number of swaps of two corners in order to get the positions of all the corners to be correct. In this case, it's exactly one swap. Then we simply figure out if that number of swaps is even or odd. A similar story can be told for the permutation parity of the edges. As it turns out, the permutation parity of the edges must be equivalent to the permutation parity of the corners, since each turn on a cube maintains that relationship. In order to handle this, the even and odd permutations of the corners and edges have to be dealt with separately, so we can ensure they always match up. Now that we have a way to individually encode each of the four categories we care about in numbers, we can combine all of these pieces together in what is known as a mixed radix number. This allows us to combine four integers together into a single integer. And as long as you know how this process occurred, we can reverse it to get back to those four numbers. And on that note, now that we know how to decode a cube into a number, let's now do the opposite, turning a number into a cube state, thus encoding our secret message onto the cube. We'll do essentially the opposite of what we just did. First, we'll unpack our number between 0 and 43 quintillion minus 1 using our mixed radix strategy. Now with the numbers for each of the four categories, you can reverse engineer each one to get back to its actual state, being careful around those parodies we mentioned earlier. First, we can restore the orientations of the edges and corners. We'll have to reconstruct the orientation of the last corner and last edge since we removed it from our initial calculation. Then we can restore the permutations of the edges and corners using the fact that their parodies must be equal to help us out. If you're interested in the detailed math, there is a link in the description of a document describing the entire process. But now that we can go between our cube state and a number, it's time to do some cool stuff with it. First, let's get back to encoding a message. Since we have a limitation of only being able to encode up to 43 quintillion, some simple calculations tells us that we have a limit of 65 full bits to work with. That's 8 full bytes, and thus 8 ASCII characters. Of course, using a different encoding format such as 6-bit encoding can get you 10 characters, and if you sacrifice a few more character types, you can use a 5-bit encoding to encode 13 characters. 
But now that we can turn a string into a cube state with our encoding, how do we figure out what set of moves, also known as an algorithm in cubing, are required to get to that cube state? Well, this is not too difficult. We'll start by taking that cube state we want to get to and use a program to calculate the most optimal algorithm to solve the cube. If you think about it, this algorithm takes us from the state we want to be in to the solved state. So if we simply reverse that algorithm, we can get the moves required to go from the solved state into the state we want. And in just a bit, I'll show you a website where you can actually try out encoding your own secret message and also decode messages on cubes with the method we just talked about. And it even has interactive animation, so it's super easy to use, regardless if you know how to solve the cube or not. But first, what else could we use our encoding method for? I gave an example with encoding a string at the start, but nobody said we have to use a string. We simply have 65 bits to work with in our 43 quintillion cases. We could store anything we want. While 65 bits is not a lot, it is enough to store a tiny 8x8 image that only has on or off states, or even a phone number. Imagine handing someone a business card that's just a tiny Rubik's Cube with instructions on decoding the phone number. That'll be pretty neat. But still, that's not enough bits for most people. If we want to store even more data, we have two choices. First, we can scale horizontally by adding more 3x3 Rubik's Cubes. With each additional Rubik's Cube, you get yet another 65 bits, which means to get to one kilobit, which is enough to store some interesting content, you only need about 16 cubes. The other choice is to scale vertically. We can increase the size of our cube to a 4x4 or even more. In fact, if we take a 7x7, we can store up to 532 bits. But as it turns out, it's probably much more efficient to use multiple 3 x 3s since they're easier to manipulate. But either way, now that you can effectively scale the number of bits you have, you can start doing some really interesting things. Perhaps storing a Rubik's Cube solver program in Rubik's Cubes, or an image, or even a song. You probably need a certain number of cubes at the start of your sequence of cubes to serve as metadata, to ensure people know how many cubes to read and how to assemble the data together. But that wouldn't be too difficult. It's also cool to take a number that has some meaning, such as pi, and see what the scramble looks like for that number. This encoding process has some uses in general cubing too, such as being able to send a scramble to someone with just an encoding, or so on. Of course, in the end, this project is just for fun. But I'm up to hearing any interesting ideas you may have down below in the comments. So now to the section you've all been waiting for. I promised you that you could try encoding data in Rubik's Cubes for yourself. And after all that math, here is the moment. Introducing CubeCode, a NPM package that can store data in Rubik's Cubes. And I've actually made an entire demo website at cubecode.vercel.app, also available in the description below, that lets you encode secret messages into Rubik's Cubes and even decode secret messages from cubes. So you can figure out what this Rubik's Cube, which I showed at the start, says. This website is completely usable without any Rubik's Cube experience. There are interactive tutorials to show you how to turn a cube for each set of moves it shows, and even a Rubik's Cube solver if you mess up in the process. Feel free to give it a shot. You can find a code for a cube code and a more detailed explanation of the math behind it for those who are curious at github.com slash evanjoedev slash cubecode. And again, the demo site itself is at cubecode.vercel.app. Currently, the encoding algorithm is likely not the most optimal and it also doesn't support higher order cubes like the 4x4. So if you want to contribute, feel free to send over a PR. I'd be happy to see what contributions you all have. With that, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video and had fun encoding something in your Rubik's Cube that only you, and I guess the people who have watched this video, know how to do. Decode. Just make sure you don't put anything important in case someone scrambles it. I'll see you guys next time. Peace.